Hey everybody, today I'd like to show you how you can use external tools to edit your Pico 8 games. On my screen you'll see a handful of windows. I've got Pico 8 in the top right with a brand new cartridge saved as demo.p8. Below that I've got a terminal window where I've navigated to the folder that contains that p8 file. On the left I've got Visual Studio Code, but any code editor will work for this demonstration. And behind that I've got an A sprite window which we'll jump back into later. Now the way you're probably used to building Pico 8 games is jumping into the Pico 8 editor, opening up the code tab, you assign a few variables, uh, write a few functions, you need to create a new tab, maybe you start splitting your ideas up, you'll have a player tab, you'll have an enemy tab, and that can go really well up to about 16 tabs, but maybe you've hit a limit, you want to split your ideas up a little bit further. The first thing you might try is jumping into an external editor like VS Code, and opening up your P8 cartridge, making changes directly in there. We'll add a new variable, z equals 3. We'll save that. If we come over here and look at the tab, it doesn't update immediately, but if we were to try and run our cartridge, it's going to load the external changes, and we can see that our code is there. This works great when we're just editing code, but let's say we went back into the P8 file, and I'm going to add a new variable, beta equals 4. Let's save that. I'm going to come over here. I know it's not going to update yet, but it will in a second. I remembered I also wanted to change a sprite, so I'm just going to draw myself a nice yellow circle here. I'm going to save that so I don't lose that progress. And we saw it because it happened on the screen here with the code editor in Pico 8, but our variable's gone. When we edited that sprite, we hadn't run the cartridge yet and loaded those external changes. So when we saved that sprite, it wiped out all that code we just changed, even though we saved it. We can actually avoid this issue altogether using another tool that Pico 8 gives us, and that's the include. I'm going to jump over to my editor, and I'm going to go ahead and erase everything in this Lua section and save it. Then I'll go back to Pico 8, I'll refresh, or I'll run the cartridge, which will refresh the external changes. And then if I look at my code tab, everything's gone. I'm back to a blank slate. Now instead of writing my code here, this time I'm going to write an include statement. So you'll see it turns orange as I start writing it, and that lets us know it's a system command. I'm going to include main.lua. So I'll save that, I'll run the cartridge, and it's going to give me an error that it couldn't find a main.lua. That's because we haven't created it yet. So let's jump over to Visual Studio Code, create a new file, save it. We're of course going to name it main.lua. And for now I'm just going to save that. I'm going to come back over here, run the cartridge. We didn't get an error. I'll clear the screen and do that one more time just to show. The cartridge ran, but there's no code in it. So now in our main file, let's write a draw function. And in it, we'll just put a circle at the center of the screen. So we'll do 64, 64. Uh, we'll make it 24 pixels in diameter and white. So we'll save that, jump back over to Pico 8, run it, and we've got our white circle. So now we've got this connection between Pico 8 and our external editor. Now, as our code gets more complex, we can start to split it up into separate Lua files and just add them as includes inside of Pico 8. And one thing you might be inclined to do is have nested includes. So maybe in our main, we try and add another include for, uh, let's say, a player script. Right? We'll do player.lua and save that because that is something you might expect to work, but you're going to get a syntax error if you try and do that. All of your includes actually need to be within the P8 cartridge. So if we go back over here and instead we do include, uh, maybe we actually want to split it up even more, we can put directories here. So we can say include player uh, movement.lua. And now over in VS Code, we'll need to create a new folder. We'll call that player. And then inside of that, we'll go ahead and create a new file. This is movement.lua. And then in here, maybe we've got a function for player draw. I don't know why you'd put that in your movement script, but let's say that's what's in here. And for our player, we're actually going to draw another circle at 32, 32, it'll be 16 pixels, and it's going to be green. So we'll do that, and then we'll go back to our main, and we'll add our player draw. My editor auto-completed that, so we'll throw that in here. Jump back over here and run our code, and now we've got our green circle there too. Maybe our draw and our editor should also have a clear screen just so we get a clear image there. Perfect. 
One thing you might notice when working with included files is that your token counts are inaccurate. Right now we've included two files, but our token count is zero. To get an accurate token count, we jump back over to the Pico 8 console, we clear our screen, and then we use the command info. And info will show us exactly how many tokens we're using up, how many characters, and what the compressed size is. In this case, our two Lua scripts are using up a total of 22 tokens. To give you a quick example of how this might be useful, let's take a look at one of my recent game jam entries, Void Protocol. In it, I've got a scripts directory with all of the code organized into a handful of subfolders. Each scene in the game, things like the title screen, splash screen, a level, game over, all of that has its own Lua file that has all of the logic that only happens in that scene. Each of those scenes tend to lean on all of my different entity files. So maybe the player is in a certain scene, or you've got a gate that the player can fly through, or a button that needs to be pressed. I keep all that, all that logic compartmentalized. One way this really helps is using my utilities folder. Now, all of these utilities tend to be things that I've pulled from different places in the community. Some I've written myself, but the nice thing about them is because all of the animation code, for example, is wrapped up in this one Lua file, I can easily pull that file over into my next project, include it within my cartridge, and I've got all the animation code. Now let's reset back to a blank cart to talk about our next tip, which is logging. A lot of times what I'll see people do is inside of their Pico 8 games, maybe in their draw function, they want to know if a button's being pressed, or we'll use that as an example. They want to know if something, some code is being executed. So they'll add some sort of visualization to check it. So we'll say if btn x, then uh, we will draw a circle on the screen. Circle fill, uh, make it at eight, eight will be five pixels and white. And then just to make sure that's working, we'll put a clear screen up here. We'll run it so we get a black screen if i press the button it shows up so that's great but maybe you don't want the visual clutter on your screen when you're trying to debug something a lot of times debugging is going to be big blocks of text spitting out variables for a handful of objects instead we could actually get that to show up outside of the editor in something like our terminal so if we want to get rid of that visual clutter and start logging outside of the editor we're going to need to make a couple of changes first instead of our circ fill we're going to use a function called printh, and it takes three arguments here. It will take the text that we want to print, the file to print it to. In this case, I'm in a demo directory within my carts directory, so I'm going to say I want it to go to demo slash log, and then whether or not it should overwrite the current contents of the file. And for now, I'm not going to do that, but let's say you put true here. Every time it ran this printh statement, it would erase the current contents of your log and write a fresh test line. This can be value if maybe every time you start the cartridge you wanted to do a print H to clear the logs and, and give you fresh logs every run, but for now we're going to leave that off. Now if we run the cartridge and we press X a couple of times, we're not getting our circle, but it should be writing to a log. So I'm going to jump down here to my terminal, just check the directory, and there is a new log.p8l file here. So in a Linux-based environment what I can do is write tail dash F for follow, and then I want to tail that log file, and I can see that I pressed the X button, what is that, six times. So now if I go back up in here, and I press X a couple of more times, or I guess it's when I'm holding it down, we can see that the, the log is continuing to scroll. So I'll clear that, I'll go back into Pico 8, and I'll try and tap the button a couple of times. If I hold it down, it just keeps going. So now we've got a log running, and anytime we use that print H command, it'll show up down there. Something I like to do to make this a little bit simpler is give myself a log function. So log will take some sort of text and then it's going to do our print H. We'll just pull that down. And instead of passing it test, it's going to take our text. And then maybe I give it an overwrite variable here as well, just so we can say that. So we'll pass it overwrite. And then if we come up here, instead of using that whole thing, we can just say log test. Actually, let's be more specific here. Button X down. And we'll save that, run the cartridge. And then as I press it, I didn't have to do anything with my terminal. My log's still showing the same thing. And now I know when button X is down. 
You can imagine how this might be useful debugging stubborn problems with collision detection or character movement. You can log every single frame what the values of the character and the objects that might be colliding with are, and it'll help you pinpoint exactly where your problems are. While we're talking about debugging, let's take a quick look at another tip. You can actually stop, resume, and step through frames of your Pico 8 cartridge. Uh, if we do uh, function update, and then in it, we're going to say uh, x equals 64 plus sine of the current time times 4. And uh, if button x, then we'll stop. So if we press x, we're going to stop. We'll visualize that x position in the draw function. Do another circle at x uh, 64 we'll make it 16 pixels and white and i forgot to clear the screen and this looked a little small so what if we make that bigger all right we've got a big circle moving around now if we press x it should stop so i've stopped the editor i can actually enter just a period here and it'll step through the next frame of the editor I can also inspect variables here. So if I do print x, I can see what the exact value of that variable is. And if I've figured out whatever I'm trying to figure out in this instance and I want the cart to resume, I just use the resume command and it goes back to running. Hit x and I've stopped again, resume, and I'm back in it. So that's another tip you can use to stop at a point that you're trying to figure out what the state of a handful of variables are, print them to the console, and then resume your cartridge. You can also work with images outside of Pico 8. To do that, what I usually like to do, if I've already started drawing some artwork in Pico 8, I'll go to my console and I'll type export sprite sheet.png. The sprite sheet part can be whatever you want, but as long as you end it with .png, that will output one large image with your entire sprite sheet. Then you can jump over to an image editor and I'll open up that sprite sheet and I can see my character and everything here. One thing that's often tricky for people working with their images outside of Pico 8 is if you use the extended palette, you're going to have colors that don't correspond to the initial 16 colors inside of Pico 8. Uh, to get around that, what you need to do is have a palette that's ordered the same way as your game is. So in this case, I'm going to load my palette.asprite from this project, and I've got the matching palette over here. So now if I switch this sprite to an indexed color mode, the data that's saved to the sprite is actually going to match the numbers here. So anything that's this brown color will be color zero, and it'll map into Pico 8. So I've got an indexed palette, and uh, I've got the, the file saved here. So the next thing I'll do is make a couple changes to, let's say, um, let's just make one of these dinosaurs red. And we're going to fill. And we've got a red dinosaur there. So I'm just going to save this. And then I'll jump back over to Pico 8. Instead of export, I'm going to put import sprite sheet.png. If I go back into my sprite sheet and jump to that tab, you can see that I imported the dinosaur and he was the right color. I can make another change here. Uh, let's see. Let's make sure we have, let's use a brown because that's one of the new colors. And we'll change this one down here. Save it. And again, I'm going to import and we have our new dinosaur color. Now it's important to remember if you make any changes inside of your P8 file and then try to edit that file and import it again. So now I've just saved this. And over here, let's say instead I wanted to change that one and I go and I import my sprite sheet. Now I've overwritten that change that I made in the top right, because again, we're editing the .pa file in, in more places. We're importing it and we're editing it inside of the editor. So once I start editing files or editing images outside of Pico 8, I try to keep all image edits outside of Pico 8. That way I don't run into those issues where things aren't synced up. One of the benefits of moving your image editing outside of the Pico 8 editor is now you have access to layers and multiple files. You can split things up, composite them back together into the single sprite sheet image, 
It gives you a lot more tools and a lot more freedom if you find the Pico 8 interface restricting in any way. Thanks for checking out these quick tips for using external tools with Pico 8. If there's anything you wish I talked about a little bit more or something you feel like I maybe got wrong, please let me know in the comments below.